to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to another episode of Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I'm Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your hosts for Commission Ed. Colin, this episode is a toolbox episode about how to run a meeting. And before we turn it over to you and Kristen for a fantastic interview, I want to point out that meetings will be part of your Air Force experience. Period. End of discussion. You will go to innumerable, just endless meetings. It's going to happen. Yep. Yet I've never one time received professional training on how to do them, when to have them, or why, or what makes a good meeting. And so that is one of the biggest motivations of this episode. And it's something that you're going to have to go out and get. So if it's such a huge, important part of what we do, we should probably get good at it. I think when I'm in charge of anything of any semblance of, you know, size, I'm going to try to have some training on how to run a meeting and when to have a meeting, because I think this stuff is so essential. We do it so much, yet we don't do it well. I'm excited to share this interview with the audience. Yeah. And, you know, it's kind of interesting where this episode is coming relative to what we've been talking recently about the development of the Air Force officer. Well, here is something that is going to help you to develop as an Air Force officer. You are going to be in meetings all the time. You are often going to have to run them. And so here we are providing you a topic that is central to everything that you will do as an officer. And hopefully that will come across in the interview and then what we have to say on the back end. So with that, let's turn it over to Kristen Hubler. All right. Kristen Hubler, welcome to the show. I cannot tell you how excited I am. I mean, I'm going to tell you how excited I am. <laughs> I am so excited to have you on this podcast because a little background for our audience. You and I work together. Mm-hmm. We are both employed at Brainstorm Incorporated. And there was a meeting we were both in where you were teaching us how to be smarter and run better meetings. And it completely blew my mind. Kristen. Oh, stop. <laughs> I'm serious. It was so good because, okay, a little bit of story time. You ready for this? So a little over a month ago, I was in probably the worst Air Force meeting that I have ever <laughs> been in in my entire Air Force career. It was so incredibly painful. And, you know, to protect the innocent, I'm not going to tell yeah. <laughs> any details about how and why this meeting happened. But here's a little bit more information just to kind of set the stage. The meeting was three hours long. Oh, goodness. <laughs> and there was certainly no reason it had to be three hours long. And it started on time, but the first presenter, if you will, didn't show up until 36 minutes into the meeting. So what, wait, what was happening for 36 minutes then? <laughs> we were all just oh, sitting no. there with our microphones muted, video off, nobody talking to anybody, <laughs> no nothing. It was so oh, painful. Man. And I wish I could say that the first 36 minutes was the only part of the meeting that was like that, but no. In between each presenter, there was a block of maybe 10, 15, 25 minutes or so where we were waiting for the next presenter to show up. And it was exactly the same thing every time. Mics would go on mute, video would turn off, nobody would talk to anyone. There was no like activity or conversation or anything to keep people engaged in between the different presenters. And it was just awful. You know, what's amazing about that, Colin, is that like, maybe that's the way that meeting had to happen. Like, especially in the virtual world that we're in right now in 2020, like people are dealing with so much, like right. maybe that was the situation but a little bit of communication, a little bit of clarity, letting people know, like explaining the why behind it right. would have completely changed all of that. You didn't even have to change anything about the meeting. Just letting people know, hey, this is what to expect. 
come ready to, you know, you'll be able to check your email or work on something else during the off times. But when you don't explain that, when you leave people guessing, then that's when it's just a uh, killer. <laughs> and, oh man, yes. And not to give away all of your best secrets right off the bat, I mean, <laughs> but we are going to get into some of that information. You're like, have an agenda, have a purpose, mm -hmm. communicate ahead of time, let people know exactly what to expect for the meeting. We'll get there. But we need to hear a little bit about who Kristen Hubler is first. Let's give you the opportunity to introduce yourself a little bit, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes of this Toolbox episode. So, Kristen, tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, what your affiliation is with the Air Force or the military in general, and then we'll go from there. All right, let's see. Kristen Hubler in a nutshell. Well, I am not in the Air Force, which you know, but I do come from kind of a military family. My Uncle Carl was in the Air Force for over 20 years. Both my grandparents were in the Army in World War II. My Uncle Joe was in Vietnam, and my dad was active duty for a few years, and then he joined National Guard and spent his whole career there and retired as a colonel. So I grew up knowing the Army. I dressed up. You're a little up bit of a military brat. Okay. I was not quite because we didn't move around. So like my dad would say I was a brat, but not a military brat. So. <laughs> but well, that but is I not a title Army. that we will perpetuate here. <laughs> but it is good to know that you have a little bit of a connection to the military, somewhat of an understanding of what we're all about here. Yeah. And I definitely respect a lot of just, you know, kind of the leadership and I don't know, just kind of the drive and passion that military and Army and Air Force, I'm sure, kind of has and builds in people. I've learned a lot of that from my dad. So, yeah, excited to be here. <laughs> okay. So, didn't end up in the military, but what have you done professionally over the course of your career? Yeah, so I've had kind of an interesting background. So, I started, I graduated with my master's in education. So, I went to school to be a middle school science teacher. That was kind of the plan. Okay. But then I graduated and just thought, okay, I could get a job right now, you know, be a teacher and that's it for the rest of my life, or I could do something different. So I actually moved down to South America for a few years. Oh, awesome. Volunteered for a while, learned Spanish. I ended up teaching science down there, and which is just a huge just learning experience for me. Just so grateful yeah. for so many of the lessons. And a lot of what I learned about meetings and leading meetings and kind of facilitating came from a lot of those experiences. And then after that, I was a director for several years, where again, also a lot of meetings, a lot of really good and really bad meetings and yeah. leading some really good and also admittedly really bad meetings. <laughs> that, well, that's how know, we learn, right? Yeah, right. That's how you learn. So I did that. Then I did kind of a career shift switching over to Brainstorm a few years ago. So it was but I honestly feel like I finally found the job that I love. Like I I love facilitating. I love being able to work with different people and different companies and just help them do what they're already doing, but maybe just a little bit smarter than they were before. So I mean, yeah, so that's what you do for Brainstorm is that you're a, mm -hmm. a productivity trainer, a facilitator of various different types of productivity. I don't know, what would you call them? <laughs> right? Was, well, so yeah. actually, I Vision, started... Right. <laughs> different I, sessions you know, help people collaborate better, use the different Microsoft tools better. If you could, just explain a little bit more about what you do for Brainstorm. Yeah, yeah. So Brainstorm, we work with companies in software adoption. So pretty much any time a company needs to deploy technology, they've got right. to get it out to all their people, right? Well, there's kind of two sides of that. There's the side of that that's casting the vision, making the plan, figuring out how are we going to to do this? What's the best way to do this? Using change management kind of expertise right. in that whole world. And then down to the end, scaling it to all of the people that work at that company and training them on how to do it. And so when I started at Brainstorm, I started as a trainer. I was a productivity coach, led all of those sessions, but now I'm actually, my title's change architect and I work more. I still do. I still do some of, the, cool title. some of the training. <laughs> I feel like it makes me sound way cooler than, than my job actually is. Christy Hello, Huber. I am Chris Change Change our, so cool. <laughs> yeah, so now I get to do both sides of it still, but I love being on that starting side of it, really being able to be at the beginning and help set people up with a good foundation. Like it's even for, I imagine there's people that might be listening to this that are early on in their Air Force career, just getting started. And it's like when you can get in on that ground level and really lay that foundation for how to have good meetings, how to have those skills that lead to that, it can really affect your trajectory after that. So absolutely. Yeah. And that's exactly what I wanted to say is that you know, people who are listening to this 
podcast are most likely in that early stage of their career and that they just received their commission, they are getting onto active duty or joining the Guard or Reserves, or they're considering this as a possible career path. And so if we can set them up to be able to run effective meetings as a specific outcome out of this meeting, but more broadly, just help them to be better communicators, better Mm -hmm. understand the process of sharing a vision and communicating a plan and moving towards that idea of scaling the change across an organization, then we have achieved our goal here tonight, right? Awesome. Well, and I love it because those are like the soft skills, right? And I even hate that term because when you think about these, like being able to lead a meeting, lead a crowd, facilitate, plan, like all that stuff, when you call them soft skills, it makes them sound like they're secondary and they're not important. And you kind of list them on your resume, but no one really pays attention to them. But man, those are the skills that take you from good to great and right. that, you know, change it from someone who, yeah, follow because you have to versus a leader you follow because you want to. So Absolutely. these are so much more important than people give them credit for. Absolutely. Well, let's not belabor it anymore. You know, people want to hear from you and hear everything. Now that we've communicated how important this is, they want to hear everything that you have to say about how to run an effective meeting. So I'm super excited about this. I mean, I've heard this before, but I'm stoked to hear it again and have my own personal recording of it so I can listen to it over and over again. (laughs) So excited to sit at the foot of the master for all things running an effective meeting. So Kristen, (laughs) take it away. Help us to better understand the purpose of meetings and how to run them more effectively. Awesome. Well, you know, and I've got a bunch of different stuff that we can talk about, too. I'm not going to do the exact same thing you heard, but I've got a few. Yeah, this is the better version, right? Yeah, this is my second time doing it. So this is more practice. You you guys listening are getting the good stuff. So, well, first, I want to say before I dive into it, for those that, you know, are listening to this, there might be people that do are meeting organizers. Like you own meetings right now, you're actively creating them and you're the one responsible for it. It's going to be very obvious what you can get out of this because <laughs> sure. you know, you're the one doing it. For those that are just starting off, maybe you're only attending right now and sometimes, and you know, you're like, like you were Colin, like you're yeah. you get invited to this three hour meeting and you're like, oh my goodness, how can I change this? How can I help this? And yep. a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about, like I said, even if you're only the attendee, you can still influence the people that are leading you and the people that are in charge. And there are things that you can do and take ownership that are going to make that meeting that much better. Like I love starting with a story for a meeting that I was a part of years back. Okay. So I get added to this leadership team and I'm starting to attend this recurring meeting for the first time. And, you know, attending the meeting, I'm kind of the newbie, right? But after a few months, I start to notice this pattern that we're repeating conversations that we already had. I don't Uh know if you've ever been there. And I'm literally, (laughs) and at first I'm like, is this like, okay, maybe it's me because, you know, memory isn't all that accurate, which is a good thing just to know in case anyone hasn't (laughs) uh, listened to that radio lab about memory. It's not always accurate. So the first thing I did was, okay, you know what? Let me start taking really good notes. Let me start writing stuff down so I know that maybe I'm the one remembering incorrectly. Anyway, long story short, it's not me. A few more months go by and I'm like, Colin, we would spend 45 minutes talking about something. And then like we would come to a decision, action items would get passed out. And then a week later, Someone brings it up again and says, oh, we have this event coming up. Do we need to talk about this? And I'm looking around the room at everyone. I feel like I'm taking crazy pills. (laughs) How how does no one else remember this? So anyway, I ended up just the fact of me taking those more detailed notes, writing stuff down. I was able as an attendee to start contributing to that conversation and very humbly and gently nudging people in the right direction. Eventually, that meeting organizer actually ended up having me take official meeting notes that ended up getting, you know, passed over. So I just want to encourage the attendees out there. This stuff, when you can start learning it, taking it on yourself, you can start impacting that change right away. And get out your notebook and take some notes yeah. on this right now, <laughs> <laughs> right? Back in the days before we had like shared Google documents and shared resources. So I literally right. was handwriting my notes. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about for a few minutes, like when to say yes to a meeting, because I think the biggest 
one of the biggest problems out there is that we just have too many meetings to begin with. And so Amen. people, right. So people automatically come in with this negative attitude about it. It's like almost a running joke about how bad meetings are, right? If you Googled meeting memes <laughs> right now, you're going to get some laughs. Well, yeah. And, and I'm actually afraid that people aren't going to listen to this episode because they're going to see in the title, <laughs> how to run an effective meeting. They're going to be like, oh, right? and they're just going to be like, no, nope, skip. Maybe we can trick them. I don't know. There's a band I, I once saw, their name was Free Beer. And I thought that was very clever. Maybe there's <laughs> yes, okay. Maybe there's some sort of version of that we can work into the title. You are brilliant. <laughs> but yeah, so we have like so many meetings. They have a bad rep already. And it's because for starters, there's just too many. Right now, there's probably meetings on people's calendar that you can just get rid of. There's meetings that you can definitely shorten, parts of meetings that can happen asynchronously. And I mean by you and I don't have to see face-to-face -to, -face to be able to get that work done. We can right. communicate via shared documents. If you have Office 365, you've got that capability. If I don't know if the Air Force has any type of software like that, or is it all I, just whatever I, free stuff you can find? No, we have... The Microsoft suite, we have Office 365, we have Teams and OneDrive and SharePoint and all of the wonderful things with most of the capability turned off. Okay, yeah, which which can be typical with uh, government uh, things. Yeah, you know, yep. you, you've worked with government <laughs> clients before, you know, know that there the is worst. so much. They're, I can't show any of the fun stuff. <laughs> Yeah. Well, fortunately, most of the productivity tools that are going to make meetings easy are, I can't imagine they're turned off because there are a lot of the basic stuff. We definitely have PowerPoint. <laughs> PowerPoint, yeah. So like being able to be in a shared document together, being able to use, if you've got the application planner, that's a great one. If you don't, there's Trello is also a similar free version yeah. that you can find yep. online. So when I talk about getting rid of a meeting, sometimes maybe that's work that doesn't have to be done and it's just going to yeah. be gone. But more often than not, you're finding another way to be able to do that collaboration and you're saving the meetings for the really good stuff. And yeah. so I've got three things that I like to say is the good stuff, is when a meeting should happen. And right. the first of that is just when you need connection, right? Like meeting face-to-face, -face, it is even like, this is a podcast and we've got our cameras on right now, right? right. Because Absolutely. there is something different about being able to see someone, being able to connect with them, even if you could get all of your work done asynchronously with those other software applications, I would still recommend getting together because yep. that sort of thing, you know, our company read the book Radical Candor last yeah. year. I think that was before your time column. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. And Kim Scott talks about the importance of being radically candid, right? Of being yeah. able to speak truth to people. And when you're working with people and you have to make decisions and you have to come to stuff, and I'm sure this exists in the Air Force too, right? It's in every company. There's going to come times where you have to have hard conversations, where you have mm -hmm. to speak truth to people. And in those moments, the only way you're going to be able to do that in a positive way is if you care about that person. And the only Absolutely. way you're going to be able to care about that person is if you have built in time to be able to connect. So that's a big one that I always like to say, even if you can do it all, even if you can get rid of all of your meetings, don't. Right. You still need some face-to-face -face with people. Yeah, because we're human, yeah. right? We <laughs> thrive on social connection. It's not just professional connection. It's not just the joy of feeling accomplishment from a, a task well done. Mm -hmm. We need to be in the presence of other people, which... Obviously, doing an interview like this over virtual is better than nothing. Mm -hmm. But if we can do things in person, if we can be in each other's faces, if you will, yep. that is where connection is going to take place. And my co-host Reed and I talk about this all the time, that you need to be purposeful about building a culture that allows for connection and care and that radical candor to take place. Absolutely. You as the officer are responsible for that. And so, yes, use a meeting to drive connection. Love it. I love it. Love it. Yeah. And mix it up too. You know, I don't know. Do you have like one-on-ones in the Air Force or the equivalent of that? Like a superior officer meeting individually with? Yeah. We do, but most often, if you're meeting with an officer one on one, it means you screwed up. <laughs> <laughs> See, okay, so this is exactly what I'm talking about, yeah. right? If that's the only time mm -hmm. we're we're meeting with the people that report to us, then 
that's just setting us up for failure and for hard conversations. Whereas yeah. if you set up that one-on-one -on -one time, and it doesn't have to be long, it can be a quick check-in. You can go for a walk. You can mix it up. You know, there's different things you can do, but making sure you're building in that connection, that positive time on a regular basis yeah. is so important for superior officers to those that report to them and then also for teams together yeah. as well. So good. Which leads into the next one. So the first is just connection, right? Mm -hmm. Second kind of goes with that, but it's anytime there's going to be a hard conversation, mm -hmm. when we communicate a message to someone, when we talk to them, the way it is received is based on three things. Do you remember what they are? <laughs> one is the words I'm saying. Yep. So how you're hearing what I'm saying right now, you're listening to the actual words that are coming out of my mouth. Yep. But there's also two more. Nonverbals. Nonverbals. Yeah. So we got body language, huge one, and tone of voice. Uh, okay. Yeah. So those three things all impact. And this comes from, well, I'm sure it didn't come from him. I heard it from Chris Foss, who is top FBI negotiator. Uh -huh. And so he's written a book and done a master class and stuff. So he talks about the importance of when you're communicating message to someone, how those three things really impact. And all of those out of 100%, do you remember what the numbers were? <laughs> <laughs> it was, no, I don't remember all the percentages. You know what? The numbers don't matter. What really matters is remembering that words are so few, 7%. That's how much words matter, 7%. And the rest, tone of voice is 38% and body language is 55. So Chris Voss called it the 738-55 rule. So essentially what that means is that there are all these other factors that matter when we're conveying a message. And so if you have to have a hard conversation with someone, even... If it has to be virtual, turn on your camera. Yeah. If that's, you know, right now, that may be the best that we can do. But even beyond that, like if you can get that face-to-face, -face, if you can read that body language, all of that is going to matter. And especially if you're a meeting organizer, you can even do this as an attendee too. Look around, look at people's body language in a meeting. Look at those who are slouched back, right. who are turned away. Like there's really, the more you do it, the better you'll get at it. But the biggest cue is going to be, you know, silence turned away. When you see someone doing that and kind of set face, that's them telling you that something's not right. right. And so when you're trying to come to, you know, an agreement about something, maybe it's a brainstorming session or someone disagrees. If you see that, you got to call that out yeah. and you have to say, hey, I'm reading you right now and it seems like maybe you don't agree. Let's talk about that. So that's something that you can do when you're in person. You cannot do when you're virtual. And as someone who has led many virtual trainings <laughs> with no cameras, it is the worst. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Yeah. And that kind of goes back to one of the purposes of having a meeting to begin with is that connection. And if their eyes down or video off, that connection's obviously not taking place. And so you're losing yep. one of the primary purposes of having the meeting to begin with. Yep. Absolutely. And then the third is what I like to call some meeting magic. <laughs> and I actually, this is kind of hard to explain is, you know, it's the thing that happens. I don't know if you've ever been in a meeting like this, Colin, but when you're brainstorming and you're sharing ideas and there's just something about being able to bounce off ideas from other people yeah. and being able to really just have this positive, you know, you put something out there, but then someone else says something that makes you think of something. And that really, I mean, if you have a really good facilitator, you can probably still do that virtually with cameras on, but that's not going to happen when you're emailing back and forth, right. when you're just putting comments on the document. Like you can get basic things like that, but if you've got to really brainstorm about something, if you've got to really come up with a good idea, that's when you want to carve out that time. And you need to protect it too, which is another good meeting tip is that if you're having a brainstorming session like that, you want to set expectations to say, hey, like, like, we're not coming to a decision right, right. now. Yep. Like, this is sharing ideas. This is open brainstorming. There's no wrong ideas. There's no saying, oh, we tried that last year and it failed. Like, this is the time where everything's okay. If, of course, that's the time to do that. There right. are times to then come <laughs> to a decision, right? Yeah. But saying for the next 30 minutes, this is what we're doing, that's going to create that space. And when you're in person, that's just going to be so much more fruitful. Yeah, absolutely.
All right. So taking that into account, you know, we kind of talked about the different asynchronous ways to communicate. So I'll just kind of dive right in then to just some meeting tips, things that I've taken away from different books I've read, podcasts I've listened to. And of course, my experience, I have failed many times, so you all (laughs) don't have to. (laughs) Yeah. So the point here is we started out with trying to decide whether we need to have a meeting or not, right? Yeah. And so if the meeting is going to help us to connect with each other, we're going to communicate information and or we're going to create some magic within the team, then we know that it's okay to have a meeting. Now we know we're going to move forward with some of these other tips that you're going to provide us. Absolutely. Thank you. That's an excellent summary. Should have done that. Well, you can work some editing magic, right? Make it sound like I said that. (laughs) Change the pitch on my voice. Absolutely. (laughs) Right. So yeah, so you ask yourself those questions. And you know, another tip too, if you already have a bunch of meetings on your calendar, I've also read like, get rid of all of them and then ask the question, what do we miss? So like, just go two straight weeks, no meetings, and then figure out, okay, what parts of that did have to happen. So if you already have a ton on your calendar, that is one option. Another is to break apart the different parts of the meeting. And because that's probably more realistic, completely wiping a meeting off the calendar is unlikely. You may be able to change the frequency of it. So if you look at parts of the meeting and you ask yourself those three questions, do we need connection? Are emotions going to run high? Do I need to read that body language? And do we need that magic? Do we need that brainstorming? Yeah. If the answer to all those three are no, then scrap that part of the meeting. Find another way to do it. If they're yes, then here are some tips that you can follow. So the first I'll say is start and end on time. What? (laughs) (laughs) I know, big surprise, right? You mean I wasn't so super excited and happy that the meeting I was a part of a a month ago was... (laughs) Didn't really start until 36 minutes after the clock. (laughs) You know, what's amazing is it's like, it's the easiest thing to do. It really is like, and I'm not talking about the times where there's an emergency where something happens. And I do think that in this year in particular, we all do need to have a little more flexibility and grace than we have had in the past. But it is the number one way to tell people that you don't respect their time, right. that, that they don't matter, that your time is more important to them. And you may not mean to do that, but that's the message that is conveyed. And so doing everything you can to make sure that you are there. And if you're the organizer, that means you're there early. Mm-hmm. That means if it's in a room in person, you're the first one there, you're ready to go. And then ending on time, you can do some things to help with that, you know, set a timer. If you're a bad timekeeper, delegate some of that, get someone on your team and to kind of keep a time and say, when you get to the end of a section or, you know, to go through agenda items, there's things you can do to help with that. But biggest one, start and end on time. Yes, please. (laughs) (laughs) Then the next one I'll say, okay, have you ever heard, I can't remember if I talked about this on the session, Colin, but have you ever heard of Parkinson's law? No, I have not. So this is the idea that a task will take the amount of time that you set to do it. Yeah, so I have (laughs) heard this, and I I just never heard it called Parkinson's Lot. But yes, Mm -hmm. whatever amount of time you allot to a task, that is how much time it's going to take. Exactly. And that's what's going to happen in any meeting you have. You know, imagine you've got a 60 minute meeting and you've got five agenda items down. Like, I can't even tell you how many meetings I've been a part of where it's 45 minutes in and we're still on agenda item number one because there's no time limit. You've got all this time. And so you just keep going and you keep talking about it. Mm -hmm. Same thing is going to happen. If you schedule a 30 minute meeting to talk about something, it's going to take you those whole 30 minutes. So, I always tell people, try to, you know, take some time to really think about how long is this going to take? Like how much, not even how long should it take? How much time should we really be dedicating to this? Right. right? Because there are some, you could talk about something for several hours, but at the end of the day, you need to come to a decision. You need to move on. And so figuring out what time do I want to give to this? Schedule the meeting for that time or schedule the part of the meeting for that time and then move on. Have you ever heard of the corollary to Parkinson's law called the Michael Scott law? (laughs) No, what is that? Desperation yields the quickest results. (laughs) I love the office. (laughs) (laughs) 
But seriously, though, like if there is something that is urgent and it needs to get done, schedule a short amount of time and it yep. will get done. It may not be a perfect solution. It may be not even be like a 50 percent solution, but it will get done. Yeah, it's, you know, figuring out what's that time. Again, set a timer if you need to. I don't know if you've heard of the tomato timer. That's actually yep. a good Pomodoro. For- Pomodoro, yeah. So if you're working on something, the reason why that's good is, well, makes you stand up, stretch, and stop working. But it makes it so that way you're going to work on something for 25 minutes, that timer's going off, and then you're moving on to the next thing. It keeps you from just draining away your time with one topic. Yeah, so good. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Then the next one. So this one, I don't, uh, you'll have to give me some Air Force input on this one because I don't know how much what the meetings are like, but terrible. <laughs> well, when it comes to attendees, so you want to make sure you choose the right attendees. So when we have a meeting, it's very often the default is to just say, okay, well, we're going to have a meeting with this team. So we invite everybody from the team or we invite, and then all of a sudden you've got a meeting with 20 people on the call. Right. And really it's just too many for any sort of productive conversation. And so in terms of meeting attendees, there's a lot of different you know, rules out there and numbers. Some say no more than seven no more than eight. I think if you have a really good facilitator, if you're really skilled in being able to make sure everyone's heard and managing time, then you could probably still have a productive meeting with 10 to 12. But once it goes past that, it changes the meeting. It becomes something different. So I always like to say, make sure that you're choosing the right attendees to attend and you're watching that number. You're making sure that doesn't get too high. And when it does, if it has to get that high, then you make sure you adjust accordingly. The higher attendees, the more people that are there, the more prep it's going to take. You're going to have a more detailed agenda. You're going to have to put more time into it. If you've got, you know, 100 people on the call, then you need to really put some thought into, okay, I need more voices. This shouldn't just be me. So... Right. Because my question there is, at what point does it shift away from being a meeting to being a presentation to being a lecture? Mm -hmm. And obviously, there is a time and a place for each of those different things. But how are you going to be aware of those different transition points? And how are you going to better facilitate the effective lecture or presentation instead of a meeting? Yeah, great question. So I like to say, you know, pick a number for yourself. If you want 10, as soon as you go above 10, that's when you need to start saying, okay, this is starting to look different. Yeah. And If you're around there, like if you've got 14 people that you really want to invite to this meeting and it's not going to be good lecture style, like it's not, you know, making that shift, then you want to start saying, okay, what other things can I do to get rid of some of these people without (laughs) offending them? (laughs) Because they say the one thing people don't like more than being invited to a meeting is not being invited to one. (laughs) Which is so crazy. (laughs) Right. So a few things that you can do when that happens, you could, if you've got a topic, you know, that you're going to talk about and you want to get other people's input, try sending out a survey. Air Force forms should be available. I can't imagine that being turned off, but otherwise Google Forms also has free thing you can do, you know, gathering some input before that lets people know, hey, I value your voice. I want to hear from you, but I also value your time. That's what you're trying to juggle with that message. You could also use representative voices. So if you've got, you know, one person coming that they're kind of speaking for five other people and it's their job to make sure that they communicate that message, they get their input before and after the meeting. You could also use, you know, OneNote as an application I love and create a shared notebook and then invite secondary stakeholders to that. So that's a way of saying, hey, and you can even do that like before you invite someone to the meeting, like if I'm thinking, okay, my number's getting too high, I can say, hey, Colin, listen, I'm starting up this meeting and I really want your opinion, but I also, I feel like your time, it may not be your best time. How about, you know, instead of inviting you to it, I'm going to give you visibility into the meeting notes and you can let me know if you feel like you want to be included. So that kind of like leaves the invitation on the table, but it lowers that number for you and then gives them visibility into what's happening. Yeah. It shows that you respect their ability to make their own decision about how to handle their schedule and helps to establish that mutual level of trust and respect between the two of you. Absolutely. 
anytime people get hard feelings about something, 99% of the time, it's just miscommunication. Yeah. You know, we tend to, as humans, we tend to fill in the worst in our heads, yeah. you know, and have imaginary conversations that never happened. <laughs> so being upfront about that, being open, having that transparent visibility into what's happening will hopefully, you know, get those, you know, maybe three to five extra people yeah. so that number can stay down. Because it really is important because if you have too many people on, you're just not going to get anything done. You're not going to have productive conversation. Yeah. It's going to be a waste of people's times. And so really pay attention to that number. And just one more thing on sharing the OneNote ahead of time and giving people access to it, that can better prepare them to be at the meeting. Mm -hmm. You know, it's part of that asynchronous preparation that can happen outside of it, that if they have that visibility, if they've put some, at least just a cursory level amount of effort into that preparation, it's already going to be, make the meeting so much better. Yep, absolutely. And that kind of leads into my next one, which is I was tempted to call this tip always have an agenda. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, so few always. <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> but the problem with that is people tend to then just check off the agenda box and they end up making this agenda that they cycle through and repeat for every meeting they're a part of. Right. And then it completely loses its point. So, really, and there, could also be arguments for having a meeting where you create the agenda at the beginning based on what needs to be talked about. So there's, I don't like to say it has to have an agenda, it has to have this way. There will also be times if you're too structured for some teams, that's going to stifle creativity. So really what it comes down to is being intentional, knowing that if you don't have an agenda, it's because you intentionally do not have an agenda right. <laughs> because you have let people know, hey, first 20 minutes of the meeting, we're talking about action items, add them to the one note so people know what you're going to bring up and then they can read it ahead of time and talk about it. So being intentional with that and using the tools available to you by letting people know, hey, this is the purpose of the meeting. This is why we're here this is what we're going to cover. And maybe this is some prep work you can do before. So, and the best part, you know, if you're creating that with Office Suite and Outlook or Teams, and then you have that shared OneNote, you can insert meeting details and it inserts that agenda right there into the notes for everyone. All these modern tools just make this stuff so much easier. None of which the Air Force is currently using. <laughs> And I'm not surprised, you know, like brains that we're in business because people don't <laughs> have all these tools that no one's using, right? You know, that's such an excellent point. <laughs> yeah. So don't worry, they're not alone. We have a company because people aren't doing things correctly. Yeah. <laughs> It's kind of like the military you know, continuing to exist because people don't get along, right? If we actually had world peace, then there wouldn't be an Air Force. And then you and I wouldn't be having this conversation. So, okay. World, right? you keep trying to blow it up. And uh, Chris and I will keep talking. Well, so definitely be intentional. And I do want to say here too, let's talk about the two different types of meetings because this is going to vary. Okay. So we've got process-oriented meetings versus mission-oriented. So a lot of what we've been talking about have probably been geared toward process-oriented, which is your typical reoccurring meeting. That's one where you're meeting with, it's a one-on-one -on -one that you meet in regularly or a team meeting in the business world. World. It would be scrum meetings, daily stand-ups, things like that. Are there any Air Force equivalents to that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, safety meetings um, okay. or staff meetings, reviewing various different reports and that kind of stuff. Yep. Okay, perfect. So yeah, so any of those are your reoccurring meetings. For that, more likely than not, being intentional for that is probably going to have some sort of like set outline. Like it's good to have structure. It's good to let people know what to expect. But then the agenda part of it, the intentional part of it is going to be probably for certain sections of it. Yeah. You know, you might have a 30 minute block in there that's going to be different every week. And that's where you bring up, you know, a new safety item or, you know, something like that. You can also, when you're intentional with that agenda, you know, our company, like this past year, we've been sharing three good things at the beginning of every meeting, right? Right. It's great. I love starting out with that. You're starting off on a positive note, always sharing three good things. But after a while, that kind of ritual can almost become a rut sometimes, or it can become, oh, like you almost draw a blank, like, and it kind of almost can lose its spark. So sure. if you have a routine like that, keep the routine, but then mix it up. Do different themed months. 
three good things about your family, three good things about a colleague, three, you know, like obviously three good things is our company thing that we did, but a lot of teams will start off with highs and lows. Mm-hmm. And I like the low also, because while I love being positive, being able to share failures, share lows also sets the tone for the meeting that by starting with everyone sharing that one, you're setting the tone for the meeting that every voice matters, that you care about them. And then by sharing a low or a failure on a regular basis, you're also letting people know that Hey, failure is okay. This is how we learn. Like we can be real with each other. If we disagree, we can bring that up. That's kind of how you sort of set the stage and create that culture for that open conversation later. Yeah, that's really important. And I love that you said that again, create that culture that this is a safe place to mm-hmm. be vulnerable, to share that you're not perfect, that you're still learning, that people make mistakes and that they can work to be better and that your team has got your back, that they're here for you. Yep, absolutely. So those are things that you can be intentional about if you're the creator of one of those reoccurring meetings. Yeah. Building those things, you know, having that structure but finding ways to mix it up, don't fall into a rut. And then also on the agenda items that do change every week, every month, get those out to people ahead of time, give them time to think about it. Not everybody can come up with amazing ideas on the spot. You know, you you need to give them time to process. So that's process oriented. Mission oriented is going to be the kind of meetings that are more maybe cross-team collaboration, something that couldn't get done during a regular meeting. They're ad hoc. They're usually to like come up with a decision or a specific purpose. For the agenda for those or being intentional for those, I personally like to stick with a simple purpose. The reason I do that is because I personally do a lot of cross-team collaboration. And so I set up a lot of meetings like this. Uh And if I were trying to create a full detailed agenda and, you know, be so intentional about every one of those meetings, I would just burn myself out. Right. So finding a habit that you can stick with is also important, figuring out what works for you. But by doing that, by having a purpose, I'm not only letting other people know, but that's almost more of an act of discipline for me. It's making sure that when I add a meeting on the calendar, I have a purpose for it. Right. <laughs> like I haven't that I haven't just said it's not because I'm lazy. You know, meetings these days, man, they almost read like lazy explanatory dialogue in a movie where right. like every like everybody comes, to, it's like a meeting in a movie where everybody is talking to each other and explaining the plot and it's just lazy writing. It's like, the Council of Elrond in the Fellowship <laughs> of the Rings. <laughs> ah. I literally just watched that the other night. <laughs> Yeah, it's a meeting in a movie is when they is they have no other way to explain it to the audience. So they're coming together and they're going to have the conversation and meetings for us can come that way. They end up being lazy. Oh, I got to do this thing with Colin. So I'm just going to throw a meeting on the calendar. So if I force myself to do a purpose every time, then that's making sure that I'm respecting other people's times. I have a plan. And then When it comes to that time, you know, I might set up a meeting and then three weeks later, I jump in and I'm like, wait, why did I create this again? (laughs) (laughs) So it also helps me. It helps the attendees make sure that we're not losing any time. We're coming in and we know what we need to do. Another thing that I really like about setting that purpose, establishing an objective that you want to achieve ahead of time is that will help you to understand whether the meeting was successful or not. Mm -hmm. Yes. That if you met the objective, then you know, okay, that was a good meeting and that added value that moved us toward whatever we're trying to accomplish. And then, you know, okay, that's something that we should do again or repeat in a different way another time and establishes also the expectation for the people who attend the meeting that they're going to get something out of it. Yep. Mm -hmm. I love that. And it's like what we talked about at the very beginning, you know, communicating that why, making Mm -hmm. sure people know. And I always say, over communicate that why, you know, you may know why you're, you know, you have a daily stand up that it's not just about getting something done, but it's more about connection. That's yeah. the reason for it. If you don't let people know that, or if you have a brainstorming session, and you're not intending to make any decisions, but you don't tell people that 
there's going to be some type A people in that room that are going to be mad because <laughs> <Right. laughs> they want to leave with those action items. They want to leave knowing that it got done. But if you say at the beginning, hey, guys, this is a big topic. We're going to spend 30 minutes talking about it. We're not going to decide anything today. We're going to go away and think more, then come back next week. Then all of a sudden, you've cleared that air. People know what to expect, and they know why it's important. Yeah, so good. All right, so action items is another big one that essentially, if anyone's new to meeting, action item is just what has to be done at the end of the meeting, right? So I've read some people talk about making I will statements. So kind of like going around the room and saying, okay, I will talk to marketing. I will schedule the meeting for next month. I will. And of course, you should be taking notes. I don't really have that as something to talk about, but making sure you have a scribe. If you're the meeting organizer and it's a big meeting, you might want to have someone else taking those notes or you're going to want to build in time for you to write down the notes after the meeting. You know, there's different ways to do it depending on the meeting, but make sure at the end, everybody knows what they're doing. And then as the meeting organizer, it's on you to make sure that's communicated, that people follow through. So again, having that shared notebook means you don't even have to email the meeting notes out. They already have access to it. And I personally love the shared OneNote because it connects with Microsoft To Do app, Mm -hmm. um, which is what I use for all my tasks. And like Colin, you and I can be in a shared notebook and we can write the action items. Kristen will do this, Colin will do this. If I go put a little Outlook task next to mine, it's going to talk to my to-do list. You can put an Outlook task next to yours and it'll talk to your to-do list. So love those cool little modern ways we can make that easy. But again, the whole point is making sure that you know what is happening next when you leave the meeting. We know if we decided anything, this is what we decided and this is what's happening. And then making sure other people have visibility into that So that way they can correct you too. I always let people know, hey, here are my notes. Here's what I got. Let me know if I heard anything wrong, right? Because we all, it may not feel like we're biased or, you know, but we all put our own thoughts into what we hear. So you always want to just kind of throw that out there, let people know, hey, please correct me if I interpreted something in the wrong way. Yeah, I think with respect to action items or the close of the meeting and what happens after, Mm -hmm. I think it's important that there always be something for people who attended the meeting to take away with them, Mm -hmm. whether that's like something to do or a piece of paper for them to read or something that reminds them of the meeting, of why they were there, the value that was gained, and it gives them something to do. Yes. Mm -hmm. So you can reinforce everything that just took place. If you don't give them that takeaway, then all that time spent is most likely just going to disappear. And you'll be back where you were with that meeting uh, that you talked about at the very beginning where it just repeated itself because I imagine nobody was taking notes. I imagine that there were no action items or there at least was no follow-up to those Mm -hmm. action items. And so it just repeated itself over and over again. And what's so funny is the person that was leading that meeting was doing so many things right. He was doing so many things right, but if you drop the ball on action items and follow through, then like that's one of the biggest ones because then nothing's coming out of that. And I love what you said too about something to take away, especially if it's a meeting where people learn something, where Mm -hmm. there was like maybe a little piece of training in there or or something they have to remember. You want to make sure that wasn't just communicated in the meeting, but they've got another way to reference that later. Yeah, it reminds me of the ADCAR model, ProSci. Yep. The second A is action, and then the R is reinforce. You want to reinforce the action so that the behavior or the change or the knowledge sticks that much longer until the next time that they are exposed to the meeting or the skill or whatever it is that they need to be working on. Yep, absolutely. Anytime you're trying to do any type of behavior change, you always want to have feedback loops or, you know, some sort of, in Lean Six Sigma, they call the control phase where you're making sure that, okay, well, this is what we were aiming to do, but did we actually do it? Are we checking back in? Yeah, love that. All right, let's see. Okay, so another one, this one is kind of one of those soft skills. So one of the things you want to do is be an organizer, and you can also do this as an attendee, is to make sure that there's 
you want to make sure every voice is heard. So as an organizer, you want to create space for that. I already mentioned that you can, by starting out with like round robin style, going around, having everyone share one thing, doesn't have to be long, by making sure every voice is heard at the start that kind of sets the tone and creates that space for everybody else. But then also making sure that you as the organizer, as the leader, are reading that body language, paying attention and not even body language, but just looking around the table is who hasn't spoken yet. Who's, you know, the louder voices, they're going to be the ones that are going to dominate that meeting. And more often than not, it's unintentional. It's not just because they've got an idea they want to share and, well, no one else is saying anything. So I guess I'll speak up. And, And sometimes it's even out of, okay, well, let me share so this person doesn't feel bad that no one's talking. But then you've just had a meeting with only four people instead of the seven that you actually intended to meet with. So making sure that you're being aware of that and gently asking people direct questions. You know, there's things you can do as a facilitator that instead of asking open-ended questions all the time, ask some directed ones. Ask, you know, for... Say, you know, I want to hear from three people on this, three different ideas, but, you know, three people that haven't spoken yet or give other alternatives virtually. You can have people use the chat in person, have people write things down, you know, different ways to get people to contribute, making sure that you're creating that in your meeting space. So the last one I'll say is to beware of blind spots. So there's actually a study (laughs) in the Surprising Science of Meetings was a book that showed that most leaders think that their meetings are better than they actually are. So it shows that we kind of have these natural blind spots to some of our shortcomings or areas where we can improve. So building in the ability for the people that are part of your meeting, the people that are reporting to you, creating that space to allow them to give honest feedback about a meeting is so important. So, And knowing that just because a meeting is perfect right now doesn't mean it's going to be perfect forever. Like work is constantly changing. So when you set up a meeting, you know, sometimes you do it in like maybe three month blocks quarterly, or if there's something in the Air Force that makes more sense for that, but saying like, okay, you know what, we're going to do this meeting schedule for this amount of time. Then at the end of it, I'm going to send out a survey, anonymous survey, ask for feedback, or yeah. I'm going to create a time in the meeting where we're going to talk about, hey, was this part of the meeting helpful? How can we improve it? Just making sure that you're allowing people to give that feedback that's going to help you grow in what you do. Oh, yeah, that's really good. Just in general, performance is not static. Mm-hmm. That you know, not every circumstance that you encounter is going to be exactly the same. The people that you work with are not always exactly the same. And so the effectiveness of a meeting or your relationships with different people is going to ebb and flow over the course of time. Absolutely. Awesome. Really good. Okay. So can I go back to one of your previous points? Because Yes, absolutely. Something came to my mind, and I want to make sure that we get it addressed. So I want to go all the way back to the who needs to be there meeting. Okay. And I don't know how familiar you are with the way the military operates, but just to set the stage a little bit, there's kind of a caste system in the military in that you have officers and you have enlisted. Okay. And these two different tracks are extremely different in their purpose overall and you know the culture that is associated with them and there's a lot of interaction between the officer and the enlisted but when it comes to meetings it gets highlighted and exacerbated interesting okay tell me more oh yeah (laughs) and so i want to address the idea of rank when it comes to who needs to be in the meeting Mm -hmm. because every single officer regardless of whether they've been in the military, in the Air Force for 23 years or 23 minutes, outranks every single enlisted airman. Okay. But the officer is the de facto leader, is the de facto manager, supervisor, just by virtue of their commission. And so whether they have the experience or not, whether they have the authority of their commission present in that meeting, no matter what. Okay. So there's this power dynamic that's going on between the enlisted airmen who have far more experience, far more technical capability than likely the junior officer who is the owner of the meeting. And 
I kind of want to talk about that, address that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up because I, I think I even said something at the beginning. I'm like, I wonder how this is going to differ like in the military. Yeah, so when we talk about who should be at the meeting, mm -hmm. what are some of the thoughts that come to your mind about the junior officer, the young lieutenant, new captain, or maybe even more of the seasoned officer who is a major lieutenant colonel, has been around a while, but then has so much more rank. There's however many pay grades between them and the enlisted airmen that are in the meeting with them. Yeah. So that's a big thing to think about in terms of like just it's almost like in any office meeting anywhere, there's different personalities in the room. Right. You're going to have different levels. If you have a meeting where you've got the CEO come in, all of a sudden, it's just the dynamic is just it totally changes. Yeah. So that's something that as the higher rank, it is very important to remember that your words have influence. <laughs> your, you know, like if you say something, you may just think of it as an offhanded comment, but people are not going to hear it that way. And then for those, I guess my question, so what is that perspective then for the younger, not necessarily younger, but the, the lower ranked officer? Do you feel like it is harder for them to speak up, to have authority? It really depends on the person, mm -hmm. whether they feel comfortable speaking up. I think more of the concern is going to be that because they are a junior officer, everybody already knows that they don't know what they're talking about because they haven't been around long enough. Okay. And yet mm -hmm. they're in charge. They have decisional authority. They have the responsibility of their commission granted to them by the president of the United States. Okay. Okay. I got it. Yeah. So there's a thing called leading up. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the unfortunate thing that sometimes we have to do when we report to somebody that may not be the, and, and I don't want to speak poorly on anyone at all. I'm very fortunate to have great managers at my current job, but I have <laughs> <laughs> been in past positions and in other jobs and situations where sometimes the person that you have to report to is you might not trust their opinion, right? You might not sure. trust their judgment. They might not have that experience. <laughs> and I think what you're talking about is advice for the junior airman or the enlisted airman who has to be in that meeting with an inexperienced lieutenant. But keeping in mind that our audience here is that inexperienced lieutenant or that junior mm -hmm. officer. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so what they need to do is create the space for their enlisted airman to lead up. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or to own up front that, hey, I know I'm inexperienced. And I know that what I say, as an officer, carries some authority, you know, carries some gravitas, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe saying something from the outset, that's why we're having this meeting, because I need you to share your voice and help me as an officer to grow, develop, become the kind of officer that you want me to be that's going to enable the effectiveness of this organization broadly, and more specifically, the effectiveness of this particular meeting and what we need to accomplish here. Absolutely. Okay. I'm so glad you explained that because I'm now I'm finally wrapped my mind around what you're saying. And yes, 100%. You know, just because you don't have the experience or the technical knowledge doesn't mean you can't make good decisions. You know, part right. of being a good meeting organizer or just leader in general is being able to let other people shine, being able to make sure that you are using all of the strengths in the room, not just yours. So if you feel like you're ill-equipped or, or not going to be there, first of all, everybody has imposter syndrome. Right. <laughs> Pretty much at any given time, everybody feels like they don't belong in the room. So just, you know, just know that you're not alone there. But yeah, I mean, the biggest part about leading a good meeting, leading a good team is utilizing your team right, is making sure that you're bringing out the best in them. And so you don't have to have all the right answers. You're never going to have all the right answers right. or all that right experience. You want to create that space, like you just said, to make sure that people feel like they can bring it up, that they can, they can disagree with you and give their opinion. And when they do, acknowledge it 
honor it. Let other people in the room know, hey, it's okay that they just brought this up right now. I'm okay with that. I actually encourage that. So any opportunity that you can for somebody who's going to be able to use a skill that you might not have and they kind of share their idea, make sure everyone knows that something you're okay with and you encourage. Yeah. I mean, when you think about it, you as the leader are not going to have the right answer, but neither does the individual who that is also part of your team. The right answer comes from everybody coming together and participating fully in this meeting. That's why you want to have the right people in the room. That's why you want to have the clear agenda, the intentional purpose of that meeting clearly communicated so that when you get everybody together, collaborating, discussing, sharing thoughts back and forth, the right answer will eventually emerge. Mm -hmm. And it's not because of you as the officer. It's not because of them as the technical experts or whoever it is that you have in the room with you. It's because you have found synergy. And we know that the sum of the whole is far greater than the sum of the parts. Absolutely. Well said. Yeah. I mean, there's a reason the best teams are going to have people that have different personalities, different talents, different skills, and being able to utilize all of those together, you know, get that meeting magic that we talked about, right? (laughs) Awesome. I love it. Obviously, so much more to meetings than anybody ever thought possible. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I know. I'm sure if anyone's still listening, I'm sure this is more than you ever wanted to know. (laughs) But who knew that meetings can be so important that they can drive so much possible with an effectively run meeting? Yeah, I love my meetings right now, man. Like I've had so many lately that have just been so good and I leave feeling energized and just loving work. And like when you think about some of the best ideas that like this world has created have have come from people meeting together and sharing ideas. So there's just, I hate that they have such a bad rep, but I think we could bring them back. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely. We need... Fewer meetings and better meetings. Yes, exactly. Just by getting rid of a few of them, there are the other ones that are left are already going to be better because people are going to show up happier. Outstanding. (laughs) I love it. Well, thank you so much, Kristen. There's obviously so much that we could keep talking about, but we want to be respectful of you and your time. We want to give our audience the ability to go run some effective meetings. So let's pause it there. But if somebody does have questions, if they do want some more information from you, How should members of our audience get in touch with you? Yeah, absolutely. People can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Kristen B. Hubler. I'm sure my name will be in the podcast link. And I have an article that I just wrote last week that has a lot of what we talked about today. So if you're looking for, if you weren't able to take notes, if you just listened to the audio, you want to go read some of that's on there too. And feel free to send me a message. Honestly, I just love being able to use what I've learned to help people, you know, be a little more productive. And if you ever have any other ways that I can help with other productivity tips, don't ever hesitate to ask me back, Colin. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. What people should do is they should get their unit, get their squadron or their group, their wing to schedule a productivity session with Brainstorm and request you as their trainer, right? (laughs) Perfect. Anytime. (laughs) Because that would be amazing. Outstanding. Well, Very good, Kristen. So I know that you are not an officer and that you haven't spent any time in the military, but we end every show with the same question. Don't fret. There are no wrong answers, but what does it mean to be an officer? Oh, goodness. As an American citizen, what do you expect from the officers who run your military? Let's see. What do I expect? I would expect... I know, like, I just keep thinking of, like, leadership, positive example, like, respect. Like, I don't know, when I think of officers and when I think of military, I think of, like, I want to think of the best of us. Like, the people that are willing to sign up or devote themselves to serving in that way and sometimes risking their lives. Like, like, yeah, that's the best of us. And there's, I think, a certain amount of, you know, responsibility that comes with that. You know, I feel like Uncle Ben, great power comes great responsibility. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. I don't know that I fall into the group of being part of the best of us, but I believe that perspective comes from your relationship with your father, 
from seeing his experience, his growth, his development, seeing how he interacted with you as well as interacted with the soldiers that he served with. And I would hope that, just as you said, our officers would absolutely be the best among us. Outstanding, Kristen. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. This has been an absolute pleasure talking about the most mundane of topics, but <laughs> <Right>. seriously, <laughs> learn so much and really appreciate your expertise, your passion for productivity and running effective meetings and as well as your support of the military uh, from you and your family as well. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me, Colin. Outstanding. Excellent interview. Kristen sounds like a lot of fun. She seems like a really happy, exciting person, which is funny because that's not what comes to mind when you think of meetings, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was exactly my experience and what led me to want to do this interview with her. It was brought up that we were going to have a meeting on meetings at work. I can see the eye roll from here, right? Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> I was like, why? Yeah. <laughs> meetings are terrible. <laughs> But she brings such an energy and expertise to the topic that I was like, I have to share this with our audience. And so I invited her. Thankfully, she was willing to do it. And I said in the interview, I am really afraid that people are just going to skip over this episode because of what's in the title and never take the opportunity to listen and learn from all the amazing information and experience that she shared with us. Yeah, totally agree. You know, I've got just a couple thoughts that I want to add here on the end, and I'll cap it off with a positive experience about how to employ these ideas and these tools. You have a positive experience with meetings? Yes. In the Air Force? In the Air Force. Not possible. Yes, absolutely. So we'll just a little teaser there. But <laughs> a couple of things she pointed out that I thought were really good. To those in the audience who are lower ranking or who aren't in charge, there is still so much you can learn from every meeting. And I loved how she mentioned that. You know, she said, even if you're not in charge, you're not the one setting the meeting, setting the agenda, that kind of thing. You can still have an attitude of, I have something to learn here. And maybe even inform that your future plans. When I do run a meeting, I'm going to do this differently, that kind of thing. I really liked how she mentioned that, you know, there's just a good life skill of always seeking learning opportunities wherever you can. And then I want to do a caveat with a lot of things she said. Again, for those of us who are lower ranking, it may be a very long time before you have the power and authority to kind of decide what meetings you don't get to go to or how a meeting's going to go. Really bad form as a brand new second lieutenant to walk into a meeting and be like, this is a meeting that shouldn't happen. You're not going to have that say, okay? So just kind of want to throw that out there. Welcome to the bureaucracy. Welcome to what it is to have rank, the good, bad, and ugly that goes with that. So that leads me to my positive experience, Colin, with hosting meetings. So I had read a lot of these same things when I was a young lieutenant about how to run a meeting because I was equally frustrated, Colin, as you had been with how yeah. meetings go. And I was given a task which would require many months of many meetings to get something to happen. And so I put a lot of these things in place. I have done what Kristen described here on how to run a good meeting. I had an agenda. I started on time. I held to my agenda. On my agenda, I had times written out, like we're going to spend this much time on this much time on this. And I went very quickly from that silly lieutenant who has to do this thing to someone who they were looking to for answers, who yeah. they respected what I had to say. We actually made change happen in Indopaycom, and it completely changed the way everyone at headquarters in my own, own unit, how they were looking at me. And I absolutely benefited from that. Instead of, hey, let's just give this task to the LT, it was, wow, this is somebody who can get something done. And I recognize I'm, you know, popping the jersey a little bit here, but I've used these tools. They have been beneficial. I have witnessed how these things can go well. And so I'm buying what Kristen is selling and I'm telling the audience, if you can even just do a few of these things, it can really improve how successful we are at the mission because that's what it's all about. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that's not the only thing that it's about. And that's something that I wanted to talk about here is that 100%, yes, 
Running an effective meeting can establish your credibility and your competence as an officer. It will get people to see the vision, help them buy in and want to support what the Air Force needs to have done. That's not the only thing. I mean, that was what I originally invited Kristen to do this interview for is to help that competence piece of being an officer, because I saw that this is a skill that we all need, but so many of us lack is how to run an effective meeting. But as I was listening to it again in preparation for this discussion, and in light of what we've been talking about over the last few months about the importance of what we've been talking about in the three C's model, character, competence, and connection, I feel like running effective meetings not only helps your competence, but it can be a huge boost to your connection with the people that you lead. If you can run an effective meeting, that not only helps to generate conversation and solutions for the execution of the mission, but it provides the opportunity for you to speak with them face-to-face, -face, preferably, unless you're having to do things virtually. But if you are doing things virtually, leave the camera on. It helps you to read those nonverbals where you can assess whether or not somebody is actually bought in. Do they need to be invited to participate more? Especially if you're going to do a one-on-one -on -one meeting, Typically, we don't think about those situations as a meeting, but it absolutely is. And that is a place where you can really work on your relationship with that individual airman or another officer or perhaps even your commander going into that meeting with them and use all of these different tools, not only to further your competence, but the connection with them. And I never had really grasped until now how powerful an effective meeting can be in supporting you in those two parts of being an officer, your competence and your connection. I'd never really thought about that before. Yeah, it certainly changed the way I look at meetings. Instead of a drudgery that I have to accomplish, and there will be some of those, Sure, it can also be an opportunity to connect. And Colin, we've already talked about how important that is. Really appreciate Kristen coming on today. Really good interview. Colin, anything else before we wrap up this week? Again, my fear is that people didn't listen to this. So now that you all have listened to this, we know that there are people who did not. Please go share it with them. Tell them, I know that this sounds boring. I know this sounds like a terrible waste of your time to listen to a podcast about meetings. But if you have found any sort of value in the interview, in the discussion that we've had, please go share it with others so that they can run more effective meetings so that they can be a more effective participant in meetings, knowing that it's something that every single officer has to be a part of in their daily operations in the Air Force. Awesome. Thanks so much again, Colin. And that concludes this week's episode of Commission Ed.